notes, okay? So if you were here last week, you have the notes. But if you weren't here, then we have some for you. Just see Michelle, beautiful young lady there with the red hair, and she'll help you. All right, so let's, uh, let's recap a little bit on some of the answers, especially for some of you that, that weren't here. And uh, so let's start here at the, uh, at the beginning. Do we have an extra set? We just want to make sure. Thank you. We want to make sure everyone has the answers so far. We have been uh, teaching on maximizing the moment. Maximize the moment. And how many of you think it's time for us to maximize the moment? As we talked about, uh, this is a new year. So we are one of two things. We are either one year closer to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ than we were last year, correct? Or we're one year closer to meeting him face to face. Because it is appointed unto man wants to die and after that the judgment. So if you don't go in the rapture, then you will go by way of the grave. We're not going to beat the system, though. Okay, We're not going to beat the system. There's one thing that Paul and Peter and James and John and, and all of the disciples and, and all of the great men of the, uh, of the prophets of old and that all of them have in common. They all died, right? So we're either one year closer to the return of Christ or we are one year closer to meeting him via the grave. So the bottom line is, is whatever we do for God, now's the time to do it. Do you all remember me talking about this guy, this pastor from Central California when I did that men's conference out there? And how this guy was had been a denominational leader, and he was uh, General Bishop Wayman Ming's uh, youth president back when Wayman Ming was growing up in Central Cal. And so he, this gentleman knew my dad. He had met my dad, had stories about my dad when this guy had come to Arkansas and preached uh, a, a youth camp in Arkansas back in the early 80s. Uh, he said he met my dad. He said all of the preachers would come together in, the, in the, uh, the kitchen area, the fellowship hall area of the campground, and they'd all talk Bible and theology all night long. So he said my dad would always take the opposite position and argue with them all night on the opposite position and then get all of those preachers believing the opposite of what the Pentecostal Church of God teaches and believes. And it's like, yeah, i never seen that before. That's right, Brother Patel. And then once after he had convinced them all of his side, then he switched sides. And he would show them where all that was wrong and they were right initially. But, uh, but he met this, you know, he met my dad there and was talking about my dad. When I was at Central Cal, I talked about my dad. And so on the way home, he called me. And then he began to weep, and he said that, uh, he said, Brother Patillo, he said, I, I thoroughly enjoyed your ministry, and he gave me a lot of accolades. He was a generous man. And he said, but when you started talking about your dad, he said, I just began to weep because I never had a relationship with my dad. He said, I met my daddy one time, and he said, I... I met him at the parking lot of where he worked, and this is what he said to me. He said, I don't want to ever see you again. And so this elderly man was in his 70s, had been a denominational leader. I, never, I had never met him before. I went out there, and everybody said, you need to meet Brother Spinks. You need to meet Brother Spinks, Brother Spinks. So I met him, and I, was, I saw what they all saw in him. Well, Brother Spinks, just recently was walking off of his porch last week, stumbled over his own feet, fell, hit his head, and now he's gone on to be with the Lord. My point is this. 
You know, we're, here he was in his 70s. You have those four kids from Idaho that were 20, 21. They've gone on to meet the Lord. So we, we can't think, you know, I've got all the time in the world. Maybe you do have time, but maybe you don't have time. The key is that we need to be ready all the time. And we need to make the most of our opportunity now. Just like I said Sunday, you know, the Adrian Rogers, that great preacher of Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, this guy from his church was dying and wanted uh, Adrian come over and see him, and he did, and he praying with him, and there's talking, and, and, this, and this man who was a respected man in the church, a respected man in the community, uh, told Adrian Rogers, he said, he said, Pastor, I'm not afraid to die. I'm not afraid to die. I know Jesus as my Lord. I'm not afraid to die. He said, but I am ashamed to die. Well, we need to think about that. He said, I'm ashamed to die because I've never won anybody to Jesus. I've never won a soul to the Lord. I'm not afraid to die. I'm ashamed to die. See, we have to maximize the moment. Whatever we're going to do for God, we got to do it now. Amen? So, let's, let's look at our notes here. Maximize the moment. And, uh, and so... Uh, Let's just kind of deal with the blanks. It says, for those of you that missed last week, these facts are good reminders that whatever we do for God, we must do now. Time is flying, right? It's quickly passing by. Remember when Melissa and I, we got married, and right here on this stage, November 14th, 1992, 92, 90, 92, 92, <laughs> I do on in 92. And so it just seemed like yesterday, doesn't it? Girl, I know. Being <laughs> For me, it was like yesterday. For you, it may feel like 75 years. I don't know. 30 years. And then we look and said, what, what's happened to the time? It's just flown by. It's flown by. I remember the first Sunday I ever walked in this church. And never had been here before that time. They did uh, some music before Sunday school and some announcements and stuff like that. And so Melissa, you know, here, she had just really met me in March. And we got married in, in November. So this was like June. So she really didn't know me. She just knew that the Lord said, that's the guy. And so she said, well, here, I've got to play the piano and I've got to do some stuff. So you sit right here. And I'm, you'll be all right. <laughs> you'll be all right. You can sit right here. You'll be all right. And I'm going to go do some stuff. And I'll be. So she came back. She's like, where's Jimmy? Well, Jimmy's around here shaking hands with everybody, man. You know, hey, I'm Jimmy Patella. What's your name? And just meeting friends. And, and it just seemed like yesterday. You know, I was meeting Shirley for the first time. And meeting Sandy for the first time. And meeting all the different people. For that, that were here then, that were alive then, meeting them for the first time. Yesterday, Darla was here. First time, boom. Yesterday, time's flying by. And before you know it, you know, I'm 53 now. You know, and I started thinking back, you know, back when we were married, Melissa, your daddy was 53. And now he looks like Methuselah. <laughs> I'm joking, Bishop. I'm joking, Bishop. I'm joking, Bishop. But now he's 83. Well, in another 30 years, I'll be 83 if the Lord tarries or if he gives me grace. See what I'm saying? So and then I'll look like Methuselah. Somebody said, Jimmy, you, you look like Methuselah now at 53, and you smell like Methuselah. But the deal is, whatever we do for God, now's the time. We got to do it now, no delay. So we must maximize the moment. Okay, look at your notes. We must maximize the moment. Uh, and then we talked about Romans 13, 11 through 14. That's our text, and we'll get to that in just a second. But Romans 13, 11 through 14 is a very power, 
pa a powerful passage of scripture. It's famous for bringing St. Augustine, St. Augustine of Hippo, to salvation. So we began to analyze that passage of scripture and, uh, and then dissect that and extract principles that can help us today. So we uh, go to page two of your notes. It says, if you will study carefully all references to time in the word of God, you'll discover that time is what? Precious. Time is precious. And so I said, let's look at three reasons why time is precious. Number one, time is precious for time is what? God given. God is the one who's given us time. What are we going to do with the time? God's time. What are we going to do with the time that God has given us? Time is precious because it's God-given. Number two, time is precious for every hour is filled with what? Opportunity. Every hour is filled with an opportunity to do something for God. I remember I was taking Melissa up there, and, and she was getting her stitches out of her hand. And, and so, you know, we went into the lobby and so I'd, start, I'd sit there and with her, and I was just kind of looking around, and I was like, man, I wonder why, you know, and I saw everybody's arm wrapped up or hand wrapped up, and I, I looked at her, and I said, I, you know, I'd, I'm interested to kind of find out why everybody's here. What happened to their arm? What happened to their hand? And so they kept calling them back. Well, then they sent everybody uh, to another room for uh, physical therapy. Well, then we were all in there. So I just got up and started talking to people. Now, why were you here? And why was this here? And, why was and then, you know, I told them, I, yeah, nosy. <laughs> Girl, I'm just probing people for prayer. <laughs> and so then, you know, I started finding out all these reasons why. And I told them I'm a pastor. They said, well, where are you a pastor? I said, in Frankfurt, New Life Church. And so sitting there, began to talk to them. And, man, they started opening up. This black lady that was there began to op really open up. When she found out I was a pastor, man, she really opened up. And so we began to talk to them. And, and so I told Melissa, I just want to bring people some joy. You know, they, people need a smile, man. They need some joy. There's so much that's going on in everybody's life. And, and think about it, folks. Every hour is filled with an opportunity to be a blessing to somebody. You can open up a door for somebody. I was, I was in, uh, in a lobby, and this elderly man walked in there, and all of the chairs were packed. So this elderly man walked in there, and I immediately got up out of my chair and said, Sir, can you have my seat? And so he said, No, that's okay. There's another room back there. i got to go back there. I said, okay. Well, I sat down with a guy next to me. That really made an impact on him. And he began to talk to me and said, I, you don't see that every day. And he, we just began to talk for about 20, 25 minutes. See, every moment, every moment is an opportunity for you to, to be a blessing to somebody. So time's precious for every hour is filled with opportunity. Three, time is precious for every hour must be faced at the what? At the judgment. We will give an account to God. I promise you, I promise you, please listen to me, everybody. I promise you, each and every one of us will stand before God. We will. Now that should motivate us. That should motivate us. To stand before the God of the universe in all of his glory and to give an account of your life before him. Wow. That should make us consider how precious time is and what we should be doing for him. Amen. So the believer is to what? The, the believer is to know the time. Somebody say, know the time. And the reason why I really wanted to hit this because I got so excited last week, I just totally skipped this section. 
Y'all know y'all know the, but see, y'all are so polite. Y'all wasn't going to say, uh-uh, preacher. Get back to the notes. So here I was teaching and all that and totally skipped this section because I got caught up. But let's deal with it now. The believer is to know the time. So what does Romans 3, 13, 11 say? And that knowing the time, that when is it high time to awake out of sleep? When? Now. Why? For, for when is our salvation nearer than when we first believe? Now. What we do now is important. So the believer is to know the time. The word knowing is eradotes, which means to make sure that you know. Do not dare miss knowing. I brought that out Sunday. But make sure that you know the time. Make sure. Make sure that you know. And it means do not dare missing. Okay, do not dare miss knowing. Don't dare miss knowing the time. That knowing the time and the word time is not the Greek word chronos, which is, is you know, the, the Greek word for like keeping time, the calendar time, etc. But it's kairos. It's God appointed time, a God appointed time. It means the critical period, the strategic or special period of time, a fixed and definite time, the time when things are brought to crisis, the decisive epic waited for, opportune or seasonable time. So it says, and that knowing the time, knowing the time, don't miss knowing, don't dare miss knowing the time. Make sure that you know the time, the kairos time, the kairos moment, the critical time, the strategic or special period of time, the opportune time. So what strategic or critical period of time is meant? What is the period of human history that we must not overlook? The day of our salvation. The day that is nearer than when we first believe. Because notice what it says in verse 11. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for. So it tells you why. Answers the question why. Why should we know the time? Why is it high time for us to, wake, to awake out of sleep? For now. Here's why. For now. Is our salvation nearer than when we believed? Now is our salvation nearer than when we believed? When we first give our life to Jesus, we're excited. We're eager to tell everybody about the Lord. He's changed our life. We're eager to come to church every time the door is open. We're eager to pray. We're eager to study the word. We're we're, we're eager to give God our all because he brought us out of so much. But I think after a period of time, we begin to forget really what he brought us out of. Y'all know what I'm saying. We begin to really forget. At the beginning, we knew very well what he did for us. But seeing after we've been with the Lord for a period of time, we just tend to forget really how good he was to us. And then we become a little lax regarding our church attendance. We become lax regarding our prayer time with the Lord. We become lax regarding the study of his word. And before you know it, we just get a little bit further and further and further and further away from an intimate relationship with God. But we dare not miss the moment for our salvation is nearer now than when we believed. And you would think that if our salvation is nearer now than when we believed, we ought to be pursuing God even with more uh, veracity and more force and with 
more desire than when we first believed because now we're closer to meeting him face to face, one way or the other. So, it is the day of our salvation, the day that's nearer than when we first believed, the day that is at hand, the day when we will meet the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. Because of the soon coming of the Lord, in your notes, because of the soon coming of the Lord, we are to be aware of the time. That is, we're to know the season in which we live as it relates to the Lord's return, and we're to be alert to the significance of the hour. Matthew 24, let's go there, let's look at that. Matthew 24, 42 through 44 states, Watch therefore, watch, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, or as a result of this truth, be ye also ready. For in, in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. So the believer needs to watch vigilantly for the coming of the Lord draws near. We can almost hear his foot fall on the threshold of the door. It's time to understand this critical period of time in history. What's amazing is this. I travel and do men's conferences and preach different places across the nation. And so I was talking to the men's director of the state of Oklahoma yesterday. He's either watching now or he will be watching later. He always watches our services. And he uh, told me, Sean Smalling, we were talking about me coming in April and doing the men's conference there. And he said last week, he said, I, I heard you take your text and I, I, and I, I was shocked. He said, because that is the text and that is our theme for the men's conference and you didn't even know about it. You didn't even know it, but God had already been moving on the leadership in Oklahoma with the very same message that I'm preaching to you guys. So you know you're in the pocket because more than just one person is saved. Now is the time for us to maximize our moment. Now, let's move on here. Uh, what time is it? It is time to what? Awake out of what? Sleep. It is time to awake out of sleep. The person who sleeps is unconscious, not knowing anything that's going on. If you are asleep, if there's a tornado, you probably don't know anything about it. If you're asleep and someone is, is breaking into your uh, storage building, you probably don't know anything about it. I remember on a fast in the early 2000s, Melissa remembers this, when we lived in Oklahoma City, we lived on Southwest 44th Street. Now, I was born and raised in, in Texarkana. I was raised on College Hill. And College Hill uh, looks like the aftermath of Iraq and Afghanistan. If you was to go where I was raised, and if I was to take you on a tour through College Hill in Texarkana, Arkansas, it looks like the aftermath of Afghanistan. Am I lying, Melissa? Or Iraq? No joke. It looks like we've gone into uh, the hood of downtown L.A. And it's just, it's, it looks like that. So, you know, I was raised that way. Melissa was not raised that way. Okay, We got in Southwest 44th Street in Oklahoma City, and it wasn't the best area of town. So we were on a fast, and I began to pray and during our fast, and I, I prayed that the angels of God would protect our property from the north, the south, and the east, and the west. Did I not? So during this fast, every time we'd pray, we'd take communion together. And I would always pray that because of living on Southwest 44th Street in Oklahoma City. But one night, probably about 3 a.m., 
probably around 3 a.m. We were sleeping. And all of a sudden, our dog cuddles Marie, cuddles for her puppy side, Marie for her feminine side. She started scratching, you know, wanting, try, getting me up, trying to get me up. She never did that. Once she went down for the count, she was down for the count. One time in the 12 years that we had that dog, at 3 o'clock in the morning, she's going to town scratching, trying to wake me up. So I said, lay down, Cuddles. Lay down. I'm tired. Lay down. She just kept on and kept on going. So here I got aggravated, and I was like, okay. So I picked her up, and I, and I opened the back door to take her outside, and lo and behold, there he was. There he was. He was tiptoeing over to my storage building to try to steal something from my storage building. And man, my last name is Patillo, okay? And boy, I yelled to the top of my lungs, get out of my yard. I probably woke up everybody in the, in the entire neighborhood. And he looked. And he said, I'm going. <laughs> but I noticed that he was, he was going real slow. So I said, Melissa, bring me my gun. Boy. And I started thinking about it. The moment he threw his long, lanky leg over my fence, the angel of God woke my dog up. I wish I had somebody to help me right now. Woke that dog up to get me up because we were fasting and praying that the angels of God from the north, the south, the east, and the west would protect our property, protect us, protect everything that belonged to us on that. And as soon as that guy threw his long, lanky leg over my chain link fence, come on, the angel said, Cuddles, it's time for you to get up and woke me up. So you're unconscious when you're asleep. You don't know what's going on. You don't know if it's a tornado. You don't know if somebody's trying to steal something out of your, your garage. You're just unconscious. You're, you're out of it. And that's how it is when, when we are asleep spiritually. We're unconscious of what's going on around us. And, and that's why we have to ask ourselves, do we really know the time? Have we really gotten a hold of the time that we're living in do we really know how close we are to meeting the Lord face to face so we've got to know but sleeping people are unconscious to what's going on around them Israel become a nation I'm un unconscious about it you know Russia invading Ukraine I'm, un I'm just unconscious about it I don't know what's going on you know it's Sunday morning it's time to get up I'm, I'm asleep I'm unconscious not really knowing and then you can even sit in church. You can be sleepwalking. There's a bunch of Christians that, that, that they sleepwalk into this church on Sunday morning. And you can talk in your sleep, and they might say, Hey, brother, how are you doing? You know what they're doing? They're, they're talking in their sleep because they're asleep spiritually, but they keep on talking. They're walking, but they're walking in their sleep. They're coming and they're singing. You can sing in your sleep, right? They're singing the songs, but they are asleep spiritually. They haven't recognized truly. They're just going through the motions, but they haven't recognized truly how severe the situation is, unconscious. The person who sleeps is also in a state of inactivity. The sleeper's doing nothing, and all activity being suspended. But while they're un inactive, they're they're not understanding the time. They're not maximizing the moment. They're not, they're not thinking about, this may be my last moment to make a difference for the kingdom of God. This may be my last day. This may be my last week. This may be my last month. This may be my last year for me to make a difference for the kingdom of God. So the reason why that they're inactive is because they're asleep spiritually. Because if they were awake, they would if they were awake, they would be active for the kingdom of God. But while they are inactive, the enemy is working while the Christians are sleeping. 
1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So while the enemy is working, too many Christians are sleeping. The devil is constantly working, and we need to be constantly working for the kingdom of God. Amen? And so we talked about the different types of sleep. Number one, some sleep the sleep of Jonah. Some sleep the sleep of Jonah, which is what? An unrealistic sleep. So how that he went aboard the ship, descended into the hold of the ship, went to sleep, and not even the storm which descended upon them aroused him. And that's how a lot of sinners are. They're sleeping the sleep of Jonah because sin is like a tornado all around them, but people aren't giving heed to it. They're just sleeping through the storms of life. Rather than turning to God, there's a storm going on in their family, but rather than turning to God, they're they're just they're sleeping the sleep of Jonah. There's there's a tornado going on in their country, but instead of the country turning to God, they're sleeping the sleep of Jonah. They are in a deep sleep when all, if you will, hell is breaking loose all around them, but they're not cognizant of it because they're sleeping the sleep of Jonah. Folks, we cannot sleep the sleep of Jonah. We need to be cognizant of what's going on. We need to understand the time. Secondly, some sleep the sleep of what? The weary, as did the disciples Peter, James, and John in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so in that week in Jerusalem, hey, David, is it? Well, hey, I'm right in the middle of teaching class at church, so let me put you on speaker so everybody can say hi to you, okay? Guys, this is my brother David Patella. Say hi to David, will you? All right. David, I'll call you back, okay? Love you too, buddy. Bye. I, he's going to tell me, I'm sure. So, but... He's the guy that we prayed for that's now cancer-free, right? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So some sleep the sleep of the weary. And the, that week in Jerusalem, they had been, uh, I mean, that week had nearly overwhelmed them. They simply couldn't stand the strain, and they, they just went to sleep. And uh, we see that today, that people are so tired of the ceaseless struggle of their life. It's just a constant struggle. They're constantly on the run. They're constantly doing something, and they're tired. And so, so because they're so tired of, of the constant strain, the constant, constant struggle, they are tired of the ceaseless struggle. They're worn out with the dull routine. They're numbed by the monotony of life. And as a result, they have fallen asleep spiritually. But while they nod, Judas is making a deal with the high priest. So, folks, we have to do everything we can to make sure that we don't sleep the sleep of the weary. Amen? So, number three, let's start here. Some sleep the sleep of presumption. Some sleep the sleep of presumption like Samson upon the knees of Delilah. Some sleep the sleep of presumption like Samson upon the knees of Delilah. He knew all of the danger, but he slept anyway. I want you to think about that. He knew all of the dangers, but he slept anyway. Why? Because he presumed that he could always rise to the occasion. I want you to think about that. He presumed that he could always rise to the occasion. He presumed that he could always go out and shake himself as at other times. Is that not what it said? That he thought he could just shake himself as at other times. And he was therefore contentious 
of all of the danger that was around him. And as a result, he was led away to the blinding irons and the mill to do the work of an ass until his life was ended. Bottom line. Presumption. The sleep of presumption. Like Samson. Knowing all the dangers. But living under the presumption that I'll just rise to the occasion as other times. I'll be able to do what I've always done. And many people are asleep like that today. They know all of the spiritual dangers that are around them, but they still sleep. They know the danger of the neglect of prayer. They know the danger of the neglect of the study of God's Word. They know the, the danger of the neglect of worshiping God, of the neglect of assembling themselves together with other believers. They know how deadly the sting of sin is, but they sleep anyway because they presume that they'll just be able to shake themselves and do what they've always done. I know, I know the truth, they say, but they sleep anyway. They presume to think that when they need to, they can just shake themselves as at other times and everything will be okay. But while they sleep, Inevitably, there comes the hour when it's too late. And it's too late for them. As for Samson, once again, they're led away to the blinding irons and the meal and the work of an ass until life is ended. So, folks, we cannot sleep the sleep of presumption like Samson, but we must be awake. Can somebody say amen? Number four, some sleep the sleep of the sluggard. Some sleep the sleep of the sluggard. In Proverbs 24, 30 through 34, we see that. And these are they who are always putting off till tomorrow what they should be doing today. They are going to be saved tomorrow, they say. Well, I, I, I'm going to sow my wild oats right now. I'm 15... The average life expectancy, Brother Jimmy's 85. I've got 70 years to sow my wild oats before I turn to Jesus. So I'm just going to procrastinate. I'm going to be a sluggard about my spiritual state. I'm going to go do whatever I want to do, and then maybe sometime in the future I'll accept the Lord. I'll, I'll do what I need to do, but for right now, I want to do what I want to do. So they're going to be saved tomorrow. They, they plan to stir themselves in a convenient season. And, and so they, they plan to obey the Lord, but just not right now. See, the problem with that is everybody thinks they have plenty of time, as we discussed. But maybe we do, maybe we don't. I'm sure the four college students in Idaho felt that they had all kinds of time but today they're gone. And I'm reminded of that old song by Connie Smith. Y'all remember that song, Plenty of Time? Yeah, I remember, I remember my brother David, the guy who just called the songwriter, used to sing this song a lot. Here's the words. I got up on Sunday morning, went to the church at 10. I listened to the words I'd heard time and time again. The preacher spoke of simple lives. It seems he spoke of mine. But I was young. I had plenty of time. I walked on down life's pathway, living as I wished to live. How to beat the other fellow, how to get what life could give. Making money isn't sinful. Having fun is not a crime. So I'll just wait. I've got plenty of time. Plenty of time to decide where I'm bound to eternal darkness or to heaven's grounds. I'm just a young girl, not yet in my prime. So I'll just wait. I've got plenty of time. Before I knew what happened, life seems had passed away. And millions stood before God's throne for it was judgment day. And now eternal darkness beckons and the name it calls is mine. 
But I thought that I had plenty of time. Eternity waits. I've got plenty of time to think of all the way or all the days that Christ could have been mine. Now my chance is over. Earth's days have left behind. You and I have plenty of time. Now I've got nothing but plenty of time. My, my, my. In hell for eternity. Now all they have is plenty of time. Folks, today is the day of salvation. Right now is the appointed time. We have to maximize the moment. We can't sleep the sleep of the sluggard and put off and put off and put off what we need to decide upon right now. And if there's any of you that's, that hasn't given your life to the Lord or if you, you, you're asleep and you know you're asleep and you're not awake, folks, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Can somebody say amen? How are we doing on our time? We all right? Got a few minutes. Number five, some sleep the sleep of Eutychus. Eutychus, E-U-T-Y-C-H-U-S. Some sleep the sleep of Eutychus. Yeah, E as in Earl, U, T as in Tom, Y, C-H-U-S, Eutychus. And let's go over to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Don't we have fun together, y'all? He didn't want me to say anything, but I'm glad to have my friend Rudy here tonight. Well, I'm just glad to have him. We're not going to make him say nothing. Acts 20, verse 7. It says, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until when? And some of y'all complain that I'm long-winded. And I ain't going to look at anybody. I'm just going to look through the corner. But here Paul preached till midnight, y'all. So think about that. Now, and there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being what? Fallen into a deep sleep. Is that what we do when the preacher preaches? Have we already checked out? The preacher is preaching. The most important words you're going to hear all week is happening right now. I'm just going to be honest to you. Most important words you're going to hear all week, you're going to hear them Sunday. More than anything, more than I love you, God's word is the most important words you will hear all week. And here this guy was, Paul, the apostle, was preaching. And he was asleep while the man of God was preaching. Are we asleep or are we attentive when the man of God is preaching the word? When preachers are preaching the word, are we attentive? Are we, are we catching a hold of it? Are we grabbing a hold of it or are we daydreaming? Thinking about Golden Corral, Cracker Barrel, Longhorn. Mama's got a roast on the oven. Are we, have we already checked out and we're thinking about work? Are we balancing our checkbook? Are we checking Facebook, y'all? Are we checking Facebook when the man of God is preaching? Eutychus fell asleep while the man of God was preaching. And it says this, being fallen into a deep sleep, and as Paul was long preaching, he was a long-winded preacher, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down 
and fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. So some sleep the sleep of Eutychus, the sleep of the injured. Now, where, where are you going with that? Eutychus fell out of the third story window during Paul's sermon. <clears throat> and But Paul said his life was in him. So it might be concluded that he was merely unconscious due to the fall. And that's the kind of sleep that we're talking about right now. Spiritually, some have sustained near fatal injuries and continue in a state of sleep. They've been hurt in church. They've been injured. They've been hurt in church. So they say, I'll never go back there again. I'll never go to the church again. I told you Sunday, Axel Rose, the lead singer for Guns N' Roses. Y'all don't act like y'all never heard of him before, okay? Yeah, I know Brother Gilbert hadn't, but y'all have. Because y'all ain't holy like that, all right? <laughs> Axel Rose, PCG boy, Pentecostal Church of God boy, raised in Pentecostal Church of God, Lafayette, Indiana, a church I've preached quite a few times. His daddy was a board member and Sunday school teacher. But unfortunately, daddy, the daddy at the church wasn't the daddy at home. And Axel Rose got hurt. And he said, I'll never go back again and quit the church thing all because he's sleeping the sleep of Eutychus. He's been hurt in church. He said, I'll never go back. I'll never have anything to do with it. And so there are people like that. They've been hurt in church. They say they'll never go back again. They've been hurt by disappointment. Something happened. God didn't do what they thought he should have done, so now I'm hurt. I'm mad at God and I ain't going to serve him anymore. Can I tell you something? If God never did anything else for you other than saving you, that's enough for you to worship him for every day, every moment of your life. If he never ever did anything else, just saving you alone is enough for you to devote your life to him and never look back one second. There's so many people disillusioned with God because they thought God should have done this and it didn't happen that way. And their hurts have left them insensible to the times that they're living in through spiritual sleep. But they must be awakened or they will perish. Folks, we cannot sleep the sleep of Eutychus. Don't allow, we're in a church, a church is filled with imperfect people. And you stick around the church long enough I know all about church hurt, folks. Trust me. I, I was born in a pastor's home. Raised, I was born on a Tuesday in church Sunday and hadn't missed since. You don't know church hurt until your mama reaches down to the bottom of her purse and gives you a half-torn piece of double mint gum. You don't know church hurt. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm saying? Give you that old piece of gum, stale, been there for six months. You don't know church hurt. I'm just playing about that. But the bottom line is, any time that we've spent of, around people, people are going to say things to us that, that maybe hurt our feelings. They're going to say things to us that there's conflict happens. And if you're looking for a perfect church, what makes you think they'd ever let you in there? Right? As soon as they let you or me in there, we'd mess it all up if you're looking for the perfect church. None of us are perfect. But hopefully we're growing to become more and more and more like Jesus each and every day, man. So there's going to be times to where people get hurt. There's going to be, it may not be intentional. Sometimes it may be intentional because people are walking in the flesh. But never judge the Lord Jesus Christ by the failures of his servants. Never judge the Lord Jesus Christ by the failures of his servants by the failures of his kids and never allow that to get you to the place to where you say I, I want to exclude myself from the assembly 
of assembling with brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to exclude myself now from fellowshipping with anybody. I don't want to have anything to do with them. And so we have to be very, very cautious that we do not fall prey to the sleep of Eutychus. Amen. There's more, but we'll get into it next week. Let's, let's all stand and pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, I thank you for your word. It's a right now word. It's a kairos word. It's a kairos timed word. And Father, I pray that we maximize the moment. With every moment that we have for you, you have given us the breath that we have. Help us not to take it for granted. But help us to truly appreciate the time that you have given us, the breath that you have given us. And dear God, you didn't give us this time and this breath just so we could pursue carnal pursuits. But you put us here for a reason, and that is to make a difference for you upon this earth. And help us not to get so consumed with making money, so consumed with building a career, so consumed with pleasure that we have no time for you. This church house should be full tonight. This church should be full tonight. But why is it not full? Could it be that the church has fallen asleep on her watch? God, I pray in the name of Jesus that not only in this church, but that in every God-fearing, word-believing church, that, Father, that there would be a revival among your people. That, Father, that we would wake up out of our sleep and make the most of our moment for you. For there are many things in heaven that we will do, but the one thing we will never do is lead a person to Jesus there. Because everyone there is saved. Now is the only time that we have to do that. Wake us up, God. Help us to be awake. Help us as I've gone through these different types of sleep, whether it was the sleep of Samson or the sleep of Eutychus or the sleep of the weary, wherever we find ourselves. God, we've got a church of people here that may be in different places or maybe several of them all at the same time. But God, I pray that this night that you wake us up out of sleep and that you help us make a difference for you while we can for the night comes when no man can work. We love you, God. We honor you and we glorify you in this place in the name of Jesus. And everybody said Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise offering tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah, Lord. We love you. We love you. Amen. Well, praise God. We love you all. We appreciate you.